Good morning and welcome to the online service from the chapel at Ocean Reef. We're so glad that you have joined us this morning. This is the first service of the new year, 2021. We, many of us are very glad to see 2020 in the rearview mirror, and we look forward to all the good that God has in store for us in the year to come. Again, we're glad that you have joined us this morning and hope that you'll be encouraged by our time in worship. Now join me as we pray that prayer that we have prayed together so many weeks through this past year as we say, Lord, help us see you more clearly in order that we might love you more dearly and follow you more nearly day by day. Amen. Now let's join together as we worship. Our scripture this morning comes from the second chapter of Matthew's gospel. I want to invite you to hear God's word. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel." Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. And as soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. Well, after they heard the king, they went on their way. And the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. 
When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said, and take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet out of Egypt, I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Well, after Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets, that he would be called a Nazarene. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, many of us can recall the voice of the legendary broadcaster Paul Harvey and his memorable tagline, Now for the Rest of the Story. Well, in his broadcast career, he made a name for himself, providing wild and wonderful solutions to real-life mysteries. His more than 3,000 episodes covered multiple topics, literally everything from A to Z, And while there may be some questions as to the veracity of some of his solutions, no one who ever heard them doubts being fascinated by what he had to say, right? Well, during Advent and Christmas, most of our attention is focused on the story of Christ's birth that comes from Luke's gospel. And Luke's account, based on his careful, methodical research, It leaves us buoyed with images of angel choirs, a vision of the infant Jesus sleeping peacefully in a manger as his adoring mother Mary looks on, and of astonished shepherds returning to their flocks on Bethlehem's hillside. But to borrow Paul Harvey's tagline, Matthew's Gospel, from which we have read this morning, it gives us the rest of the story. He covers Jesus' birth in an economy of just eight words. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, that's all he has to say about it. The rest of the story, according to Matthew, is the story of mystery, of mayhem, and of the Messiah. Now, it involves the mystery of the wise men, a star and a child, It it tells of the mayhem caused by the actions of a murderous, paranoid king. And Matthew's purposeful telling leads us to his claim that this child is Israel's long-awaited Messiah. Now, there are a lot of skeptics out there who would claim that Matthew's narrative, like some of Paul Harvey's solutions, it's entertaining but not necessarily true. So the question I want to put before us this morning is this. Is Matthew's account, is it pious fiction, or is it plausible fact that's worthy of yours and my confident trust? Well, first, let's begin by considering the mystery, the visit of the wise men to meet the Christ child in Bethlehem. Now, Matthew's claim is that these wise men who came from the east came because they had seen his star in its rising, and these magi had witnessed 
an astronomical event. Well, I want to suggest this morning that the star, the story, is plausible for three reasons. First of all, because it was part of popular secular belief at the time. Secondly, it reflects the witness of Scripture. And finally, because it actually has some solid basis from evidence in modern astronomy. A Roman culture associated heavenly portents with the birth of important figures in history. Virgil, the historian, writing in the first century before the birth of Christ, wrote about a promised child, the offspring of the gods, who would bring in a golden age of peace and prosperity to the Roman world. Of course, it was the emperor. Well, unusual astronomical occurrences were understood as divine omens in Roman culture. So it's no wonder, really, that Jesus' birth, like that of Caesar Augustus, was depicted as important because of the appearance of a miraculous star. Well, let me say that that sort of cultural expectation associated with human rulers, that was really preparation on God's part so that they would be receptive when they heard and understood the good news of the gospel that began with a star shining on God's king who had come from heaven to earth. Then the Hebrew scriptures of the Old Testament, they placed great importance on the appearance of a star in associated with its messianic expectations. In the book of Numbers, how many of you read Numbers this morning before you came? <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. Well, in the book of Numbers, part of the Torah, in the 24th chapter, Balaam, who is a non-Israelite prophet, he was asked by Balak, the king of Moab, to place a curse on the people of Israel. And the question is why? Well, it's because they were camped out on his front doorstep and he felt threatened by their presence. But rather than the curses that Balaam was asked to provide, all he could speak were only blessings. And in one of his visions, he spoke prophetically in these words. He said, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. Well, Matthew continually uses the theme of fulfillment as proof to his readers that Jesus is the Christ, the long-awaited Messiah of Israel. Well, the fulfillment of Balaam's prophecy in the birth of Jesus was one that was great, of great importance to the Jewish people in substantiating Jesus' identity as Israel's long-awaited Messiah. Well, much more recently, two people, an astronomer and an attorney, they have developed evidence that validates Matthew's claim of a star. Uh, now, how many of you viewed the Christmas star in the past week? Uh, when Jupiter and Saturn were, were there together, they were only separated by 400 million mi miles. Well, this also happened back in the 1600s. And the great German mathematician and astronomer, Johannes Kepler, his observations set forth the theory of planetary motion. Well, Craig Chester is a present-day astronomer. He has fairly significant credentials. He went to some mediocre school called Case Western Reserve University. Some of you have heard of that, where he earned his Ph.D. He claims that the star of Matthew's gospel was a real historical event, including the idea that it stopped over the place where the child lay. He explains this, he says, by Jupiter's appearing stationary during what astronomers call a retrograde, a looping motion where it appears to stop and then reverse direction in relationship to the Earth. Well, an attorney, this certainly makes it questionable, an attorney by the name of Rick Lawson, he teaches law at Texas A&M, and he built on the work of Chester 
And he studied the gospel of Matthew and he identified nine qualities of the Bethlehem star. And that became the basis of his highly respected documentary that was released in 2007 called The Star of Bethlehem. So I want to say that when you take these three things together, the cultural expectations, the biblical witness, and modern insights from astronomy, I want to say that it is certainly plausible to believe that Matthew's account has far more credibility than just being pious fiction. Well, next, there's the matter of the mayhem caused by the actions of murderous King Herod. And we're referring to Herod the Great. His background is very, very important to understand. First of all, he is not Jewish. He was from a native of Edom, the area down around Petra, south of the Dead Sea. And he was part of a people who had a tumultuous relationship with the Jewish people. Now, Herod's kingship was not by birth. Rather, it was bestowed by Rome. He was appointed as king of the Jews by the Roman Senate, which started the Herodian dynasty. Well, upon learning from the wise men of one who was born king of the Jews, whom they had come to worship, his paranoia became ominous. He was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him for good reason. First, inquiring of the Jewish religious leaders, he, being non-Jewish, wanted to know where the scriptures indicated that the Messiah would be born. Well, they easily answered Herod with a reference from the prophet Micah. It reads, But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel whose origins are from old, from ancient times. And then turning to the wise men who had come to him, he deceitfully encouraged them to find the child and then report back so that I may worship him as well. Well, as we read when the wise men who had been warned by God in a dream not to go back to Herod and instead returned to their own country by another route, Herod took murderous action. Now, you need to know that his action was not out of keeping with his character. He belongs in the same league with Stalin, with Hitler, with Mao, with Pol Pot, with Idi Amin, with Saddam Hussein, with Kim Jong-il, and the list could go on and on and on. We know of him that when he came to power in Israel in 44 BC, the first thing he did was to slaughter the last remnants of the Jewish Hasmonean dynasty. He had half of the members of the Sanhedrin executed. And he killed 300 of his own court officers. He murdered his wife, her mother, and three of their sons. That's where the saying came about that it's far better to be Herod's dog than his wife or his child. And as he lay dying, he gave orders that all of the notable men of Jerusalem should be assembled in the Hippodrome and at the moment of his death that they all be killed. So for Herod, taking the lives of 30 or so children in Bethlehem, young boys, two and under, meant absolutely nothing to him. It was only a necessary action to maintain his hold on power like every other dictatorial tyrant. Yet, Matthew is aware that even this tragic moment in the lives of God's people did not occur without God's foreknowledge. The weeping prophet Jeremiah had written hundreds of years before these words, this is what the Lord says. A voice will be heard in Ramah, mourning and great weeping, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Rachel, for those of you who may not be aware, was the favorite wife of Jacob, 
the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. And she is considered as the mother of all Israel for all time. The murder of innocence, as it is known, is no pious fiction. It is a tragic history written in the blood of innocent Jewish boys, toddlers and younger. It is an early instance of the hateful intentions of evil whose unending desire is to destroy God's good and gracious plans for his world through Israel and through his Messiah. It's interesting that the scriptures don't really tell us how many wise men there were, do they? We infer that there were three because of the number of gifts. And they most likely did not arrive at the manger scene just as the shepherds were leaving. They most likely came months after the birth of Jesus. But what is clear from the scriptures of the Hebrew Bible and from the gifts that they brought it was that they had come to worship the one who was born king of the Jews. They brought him gifts of gold, gifts fit for a king. They brought him frankincense. Frankincense is a costly resin found in the Arabian Peninsula, and it was used by the Jewish priests in the temple as they made their fragrant offerings to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It could not have been a more appropriate gift, could it, for Jesus, who as our high priest would make his own life an offering that you and I might be reconciled to God through his work on the cross. And they brought myrrh. Myrrh was a spice used for embalming the dead. It was a reminder that the one who was born to be king was also the one who was born to die. The psalmist had written years earlier saying, may the kings of Sheba and Seba present him gifts. May all kings bow down to him and all nations serve him. Hundreds of years before the prophet Isaiah wrote, all from Sheba will come bearing gold and incense and proclaiming the praise of the Lord. And Jeremiah the prophet foretold of the days to come when I will raise up for David, God said, a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. This is the name by which he will be called the Lord, our righteous Savior. Well, these wise men had come from Babylon, from Sheba, in fulfillment of what God had foretold through the Psalms and the prophets hundreds of years in advance. And each of the gifts that they offered bore witness to the true identity of the child that they had come to seek in response to his star, which they had seen and followed. Jesus is the Messiah of Israel. Now, I want to say that the probabilities of pious fiction being written with such precision about events centuries in advance, those probabilities are so infinitesimally small that they stagger beyond belief anybody who claims that these are just a pious fiction. Matthew reportedly underscores his credibility with those to whom he's writing by saying it was written that it might be fulfilled. And it's clear that the appearance of the wise men at the beginning of his gospel, it underscores another theme that will be emphasized through everything that Matthew has been inspired by God's Spirit to write. And the theme is this, that God's concern through the Jewish people and through Jesus the Messiah God's concern is for all of the nations of the world for all time. That's why following Jesus' resurrection, Matthew records the commission that Jesus gives his followers to go and make disciples of all the nations. And friends, that commission has been and is being fulfilled among every tribe, tongue, language, and nation even to this very day. 
So that's the rest of the story. Does it prove beyond the shadow of a doubt that what Matthew wrote is true? I want to say on one hand, of course not. Faith is not based on some artificially imposed scientific notion of proof. Friends, this is God's word to us, and it is utterly reliable and worthy of our complete trust. So let me frame the question a different way. Does the evidence from history, from the witness of Scripture, from the integrity of Matthew's purpose in writing, even from modern scientific investigation, does it make Matthew's account far more plausible than pious fiction? I want to say I believe so with all my heart. I'll stake my life on it. Let me close with this. As we've listened to the story this morning, maybe you've noticed that there have been three different responses to the coming of Jesus. The first, it's the response of Herod. It's the response of hostility to the news of another king. Opposition to Jesus in every age is deeply rooted and manifested in the lives of those who are either unprepared or unwilling to acknowledge who he is and his gentle, gracious reign. And you and I see many, even today, who are prepared to go to any and all lengths to deny all traces of him in history, and especially to deny any legitimacy of his claim on our lives. There's a second response. It's the one from the Jewish leaders. They knew all the right answers, didn't they, when Herod asked the question? But they were completely indifferent to Jesus when he came. Their response was like some today. Have any of you heard that the vaccine may be out and that inoculations may be available? Well, this reminds me that these people had been inoculated with faith. They had had just enough of a dose of church or maybe just enough of a dose of being religious to keep them from having an authentic encounter with the living God and having the real thing. And then finally, and thankfully, there are those today like the wise men. By God's grace, they and we recognize who Jesus truly is. We confess that he is the Messiah of Israel. We confess that he is God's longed-for promised sovereign over all the earth. He is the one we are still waiting on to return. He is the one who will be crowned King of kings and Lord of lords. He is the one, not a Democratic president or a Republican president, who will establish God's kingdom of justice, righteousness, and peace, one that will know no end. Let me close with this. As you and I wait for the day to come, we bow before him and we offer worship fit for a king. My question of you is this. Who will you be? And how will you respond to him? You see, wise men and wise women still seek him. Friends, that's the rest of the story. Thanks be to God. Amen.
thank you for joining us this morning. And now hear this benediction. Friends, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and fill you with his peace today and every day throughout this new year. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless. Have a great week.